being here. Uh, I want to ask you to uh, take your ribbon thing, Bob, your marker and your Bible if you have one. Put it in the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John chapter 19. The Gospel of John chapter 19. We're going to turn there in a little while and do some work. And then we're going to go to our uh, text passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. So I think I'm on, aren't I? Can you hear what this? I wasn't okay. hearing. Okay, let me do this. I might have turned yeah, it off. There you go. Okay, yay for me. I did it. Okay. <laughs> All right. I know we use that mainly for uh, YouTube and so on. But um, all right, one Corinthians fifteen. I'm really uh, thankful we're here tonight. I uh, what we're going to go over is uh, it's an angle that most people have not thought about uh, concerning the gospel, and so I'm looking forward to us to trying to get that across. Tomorrow night uh, is. Uh, tonight is and that he was buried tomorrow night is that he rose from the dead and so that's why we're in this room tonight he rose from the dead I look forward to trying to get that across tomorrow night <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15 if you're able I'm going to ask you to stand please uh, I ask people to stand that we might give uh, just a reminder that we ought to give reverence and honor to the eternal infallible inerrant perfect preserved word of god that we have he's so good to us that we're not trying to find it or figure it out we just need to read it and heed it amen, amen. so 1 corinthians chapter 15 uh, hopefully what we did yesterday some, you'll see some of those pictures as i read uh as we read together verse one moreover brethren i declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now the way I define it and I say and I try to teach you is that the gospel is 26 words long and it's explained by the Apostle Paul or given by God in 1 Corinthians. It starts with Christ and it goes down. So Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel actually in its entirety. I've had, uh, I've taught that and preached that uh, um, a while, and I've had a couple of people that feel like, no, 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 no. You can't say that. That's not the entire thing because there's so much more. There is much, much more. But these 26 words actually cover everything. Christ is the Son of God. He's Christ. He's the Christ. And we are sinners. And he died for our sins. According to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day. Amen. According to the scriptures. Amen. Hallelujah for all that that entails. And we're going to work on some more of that tonight. So if you don't mind, I would like to have prayer. <clears throat> I sure need God's help again tonight. Let's pray. Our great God, I do come to you again. And I just want to say thank you again. Thank you for loving me, for loving us. Thank you for proving that. And God, thank you for providing for us a way to be forgiven of our sins. So thank you that you died for my sin. Thank you, Christ. Thank you for the opportunity to assemble and open up your book. I pray that you would bless our endeavors tonight. That you would be glorified and honored. And God, all of us would be ready, submissive, agreeable with whatever you speak to us about. And of course, Jesus, those that are not yet born again, they're not ready for eternity. We do ask you, please, to touch their heart, convince them of their need of their sin. That they need a Savior, they need a forgiver. I pray they'd say yes to you. So we do love you tonight. We thank you for loving us. 
We sure do look forward to when we get to see you. And it's in your mighty and holy name we pray, Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I'm getting ready to read what I have as an introduction. What I'm saying right now is not written down. But uh, when I read this, I call it the third word. It could be the third and fourth word. I'm not sure if it's a single word or a hyphenated word or two words. I don't know how to spell it for sure. I've not really looked it up to try to figure it out because I know the word. And some of you, most of you will know the word. And so if you don't know the word, it's the third and fourth word I'm going to say. If you don't know it, uh, we'll talk to you after church and try to explain it to you. Okay, here we go. There are highfalutin. Hopefully you know that, what that means. I don't know how to spell it. There are highfalutin theologians out there that are bubbling over with biblical knowledge. But they have nothing because their knowledge is altogether void of the saving truth of the gospel. There are religious dabblers out there. They know some Bible facts. They have a head knowledge of Jesus. But they're absolutely empty on the inside because they don't have the saving truth of the gospel. There are even people in our churches who call themselves Christian. But literally they have nothing because they do not possess the saving knowledge of the gospel. I, I think that's one of the reasons that God had Apostle Paul write this and what <coughs> excuse me why that it's become uh, such an anchor in the New Testament that uh, when Paul says, hey, I, I want to declare to you the gospel. He, you, I've already preached it. You've already received it. He said, it's where you stand. It's how you got saved. And uh, the gospel, Paul lets us know that he said, I deliver unto you first of all that which I also received. The gospel is first. Somebody please say amen to that. It's number one. It's not just first numerically. It is first in position. It's got to be the first thing. First things first, as we might say. As Christians, as God's children, we have an obligation to know and understand the gospel. Why? It's so we can know and experience the gospel, but so also we can explain it to other people. That is a requirement that God wants us. In fact, He said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. That's not just for a few missionaries and preachers. It's for every believer. It's our responsibility. He's given us that uh, responsibility to get the gospel to everyone. And since we're talking about it, the gospel is where the power is. Remember one, uh, Romans 1 Romans 1.16? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And so we need to be aware, we need to know the gospel. Jesus died for our sins. He died on the cross. The God-man was our substitute. So instead of God's wrath coming again against each of us for our sins, Jesus Christ died on the cross, listen to this, enduring the very wrath of God as a substitute in our place. Somebody ought to say amen for that. Thank you, Christ, for doing that. So when we look at the gospel, one of the things I've tried to get across is that who Christ is, He's the Son of God, but that He died. Here's another way to say it. He paid for our sins. Amen. Hallelujah. The second part of the gospel is these five words. And that He was buried. Why is that so important? I... Uh, 
I don't make an issue of it, but to divide the gospel into three parts, death, burial, and resurrection, I'm not against that, okay? But my brain doesn't hinge on that, but if we were going to do it like that, we would say, hey, uh, the burial is one-third of the gospel. Amen? So it's, it's got some weight to it. It's got some, I would say, import to it. But what is it about? What, what is this? And that he was buried. And so what we're going to do, we're going to work in Romans. So if you're in the book of Corinthians, right in front of Corinthians is Romans. If you would go to uh, Romans <clears throat> chapter 6. I wanna, we're going to do a little work here, work through some verses, and uh, try to catch part of this, okay? So, Romans chapter 6. All right. You ready to... Uh, let me say this before I read the verse. Paul the Apostle talked about the grace of God often. It's one of his themes. Brother Justin just mentioned, you know, we sang the song about the grace of God. Then he mentioned we're here because of grace and everything we have is because of grace and we love grace. Well, Paul talked about grace a lot and evidently there was somebody in the church in Rome that also thought the grace of God was awesome. And they thought it was so awesome that they wanted to know more of the grace of God. In fact, they wanted more grace. And so they were trying to figure out, how can you get more grace? What do you got to do to get more grace? Somebody came up with this idea in the Church of Rome. They said, here's what we need to do. All you have to do is go out here and commit some sin. When you sin, then you can get more grace. <laughs> is that insane or what? No, 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 but it, it is true. Look what Paul said in verse 1. Uh, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound the next two words say God forbid another way to say God forbid are you out of your mind are you crazy what is wrong with you I personally because I guess maybe how I was raised or whatever I think God forbid might have a physical movement that goes with it God forbid <laughs> And you smack them upside the head like, what is wrong with you? You don't go sin to get more grace. And Paul the Apostle is stirred up about that. He said, what are you going to do? You're going to go sin so you get more grace? Ah, God forbid. Look what he says, verse uh, 2. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now that's uh, quite the statement right there. How shall we that are dead to sin? I wonder who we is. I think he's talking to the church of Rome. The church at Rome. And so these are believers. So people that are believers are supposed to be dead to sin. I don't know if that does anything in your brain or not, but I was wondering maybe if you've sinned the last couple days. Is there anything you've done that God would consider sin? Are you a believer? Amen. How should we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If we're saved, we're supposed to be dead to sin. Yep. That's kind of what it sounds like. If we're dead to sin, we ought not be trafficking living in sin. Seems like some of us, well, I'll just go ahead and say, I'm gonna, I hate to do a blanket statement, but I know it's true. Seems like all of us do sometime or another. I was just gonna say, it seems like I do, but I'm just gonna include everybody, because everybody does, except my wife. Because I, I don't know any sin she commits. Anyway. That's her. That's between her and God. I can't get into that. Okay. No, I'm not going to try to tell you what sin you committed. Okay. 
All right, so are you here? No, no, no. Since he said that, now watch what he says. Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Ooh, now we need to talk a second. I know where I'm standing. I'm at Albury First Baptist Church. I know Pastor Gibson. I've known him for several years now. And I know that he is a Baptist preacher. Baptist pastor. He believes the Bible is a Baptist book. That if you believe the Bible, well, you'll end up being a Baptist. <laughs> the way it goes. And so, as a Baptist, whenever we hear the words, know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, we can't help it. We're Baptists. We cannot help it. When we hear the word baptized, we can't help it. We think of... We think of water. Our brain, we cannot help that. No, you're not. There's so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. And that's just how our brain thinks. No, 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 no. The word baptized does mean to dip, to plunge, Immerse to place into. That's what it means. Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ? But no, 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 let's just stop a second. Do you know it's possible to get baptized into something other than Wawa? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. My dad used to say, occasionally, he'd say, looks like some of you people were baptized in vinegar. <laughs> I, if I could choose something to be baptized in, that you know, if someone says you got to be baptized in, and you get to choose what it is, I would probably choose banana pudding. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Come out, you got some vanilla wafers on your head, and you're going, "This is awesome." I got placed into banana pudding. Is everybody with me? So when you get baptized, it doesn't have to be Wawa. In fact, the scripture even says, know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ. That's right. We were placed into Amen. Jesus Christ. Now when did I get put in Jesus Christ? When did that happen? When I got in the Wawa? Uh, no. It happened the moment, the moment I realized I was a sinner, he's the Savior, watch, and I received the gospel. Somebody say amen. amen. The moment I received the gospel, my dead spirit was made a living spirit. It was regenerated. I was born again at that moment. Amen. Watch, at that very moment, the, the spirit of the living God came and took up residence in me. He lives in me. You could say God came to live in me. Because God the Spirit, God the Father are the same. You could say that Jesus came to live in me. That's right. I became, I am the dwelling place of God now. Amen? That's right. I was placed into Christ. Watch this. A remarkable phenomenon happened at the very same moment I was placed into Christ. He was placed into me. And I became a Christian. I became born again. I was placed into Jesus. When did that happen? At the moment I received Christ as my Savior. Amen? Amen. At that very same moment, I was regenerated. And He moved in and took up residence. I was placed into Him and He into me. And I'm not going to go there, but it says in the book of John that what was in the Father's hand, no man can pluck it out of his hand. So anyway, when I got placed, remember the word baptized, we always think of water. No, you're not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. When I got placed into Jesus, I got the benefit of Jesus. What was the benefit of Jesus? One of the benefits is... 
He died for my sin. Somebody ought to say amen. He died for my sin. I got the benefit of his death. Watch what the Bible says. Look at it again. <clears throat> Verse 2. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were placed into, were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Now, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Look at the next verse. If we've been planted together in likeness of his, of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. This is incredible. I got placed into Jesus and I got the benefit of his death. What did he die for? He died for my sin. So when I got placed into Jesus, that means my sins are paid for. Amen. And then it says that I was buried with him by baptism. Well, what does that mean? That I got in the water wah -wah, and that's him when I was buried with him? No, I got, the, I got placed into him at salvation. I got the benefit of his death, but I also got the benefit of his burial. I was buried with him by baptism into death. So I died with him. I was buried with him. Now look what the Bible says. This is awesome. Uh, verse number uh, 5. I mean, I'm sorry, 4. It says... We are buried with him by baptism to death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If we've been planted together with Christ, we shall also be raised with him. Watch, watch. I got placed into Jesus. I got the benefit of his death. I was buried with Jesus. I got the benefit of his burial. Also, I was raised with Jesus to walk in newness of life. Ladies and gentlemen, the only way any human on this planet can walk in newness of life is by, with, in, through Jesus. Amen. You cannot walk in newness of life on your own. It's impossible. It'll drive you nuts. It'll drive you crazy. You'll go, well, the Christianity is not working out for me. It's just, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. It doesn't work. You're right. You can't do it. That's right. But we are raised with him. And we walk in newness of life. And now this life I am living, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here's another way to say it. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Or yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Somebody ought to say amen. It's a hallelujah what he's done for us. We get the benefit of his death. My sins are paid for. I get the benefit of his burial. I'm getting ready to talk about that in a bit. And then I get the benefit of his resurrection. I now have the ability to walk in newness of life. All right, here we go. Let's do a little bit more. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is dead. It says crucified with him. Ladies and gentlemen, the result of crucifixion is death. Amen? That's right. So... The old man is dead. How did the old man die? He died with Christ. Watch. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. When I got placed into Jesus, I get the benefit of his death, and now I can say the body of sin is dead. It hath no more dominion over me. Amen. Oh, let's keep reading. Watch out. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died into, into sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Alright, no, 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 no. I know it's a lot of depth in here. We're not going deep, I'm telling you. But I was placed into Christ... And I got the benefit of his death, so I am buried with him. Amen? Amen? I'm dead. I'm not only buried with him, I'm dead. That the body of sin, it might be destroyed. Is everybody with me? I was raised with him, and now I can walk in newness of life by his power. But now you've got to look at verse number 11. Likewise, reckon 
ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Let not sin, therefore reign, have control in your mortal body, that you should obey it and the lust thereof. All right, oh, no, no, let's just stop, stop. So once a believer gets saved, once we get saved, we never sin anymore. That's not what the Bible just said. The Bible says we are dead to sin. What does that mean? Watch. It means that sin does not have to control me. It doesn't have to. How come? I'm dead to sin. Then he says, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead. That word reckon, it's a, I think it's a word from the South. I'm from Kentucky, I'm from Oklahoma, Nancy's from Texas, we say I reckon so. But reckon is actually a uh, mathematical term that you would use if you were keeping books. You were, you're, you've got the deposits and you got the subtractions and you got all these items that you paid for and you got to subtract them. And then you have to reckon the numbers all together to be sure you have the right number down here. The bank would prefer us to reconcile it with them, that we agree with that. And when we don't, we're going, well, where is it? I'm missing $3.22. And so if you're like me, you go, no, nah, that's not much. Don't worry about it. But if you're like my mother, you cannot stop until you find three dollars and 22 cents she's done it for three days before so mom you need to let it go uh-uh we're gonna find out where that is <laughs> likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin he's saying hey mccracken you need to do the accounting in your life and realize that you're dead to sin, how'd you die? You died with Christ. That's right. It does not have to have dominion over you. Amen. It doesn't have to rule your life. I have, I've, I've been a Christian since I was just a boy, but I'm telling you, I have been through it that I said, oh, I just can't stop, I can't stop sinning. And I don't know. I'm, supposed to, I'm saved, I know I am, but I just keep giving in to the flesh. I don't know what my problem is. I keep sinning, I keep doing the same thing over and over and over. I'm, I'm a wreck. I'm messed up. And I try to act like that it's not my fault. Sin has power over me and it's got a hook in me and I can't get it out. The Bible says, no, 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 no. You're dead to sin. And then the Bible says, reckon yourselves indeed to be dead. So you got to tell yourself no, you don't get to have your way. And yourself is going, it doesn't matter, I'm going to have my way anyway. And you go, you're not the one in charge. The Lord's in charge. Well, he's not in charge in your life because you're always messing up. Well, it's because you won't reckon it to be so. Is everybody with me? He's trying to help us that we don't have to continue in sin to get grace to abound. In fact, he said, Dah, are you out of your mind? God forbid. He said, if you're dead to sin, you don't have to live any longer therein. Then he says, reckon it to be so. Amen? Amen. All right, now watch. When uh, we were buried with him, let me get my notes here. Uh, we are buried with him placed in him by baptism into death and like as Christ was raised up from the dead even so we should be now what we should walk in news of life brother Jerry Vines is a retired preacher from Florida outstanding pulpiteer preacher but he said it like this he said uh, when Jesus came up out of that tomb he left, our, he left his grave clothes and our sins behind. Our sins were buried with him. And our sins are left behind. So when we talk about the death of Jesus Christ, his death is to pay for our sin. Amen? Amen. 
Listen, He died for our sin. He paid for our sin by death. If Jesus did not die, uh, we'd be in trouble. Yes. We need to be absolutely sure that He died. When it comes to salvation and the matters of everlasting life or eternity, we don't need to be pretty sure our sins are paid for. We need to be certain our sins are paid for. Right. When you're facing the wrath of God and eternal judgment, it's a, it's a situation that demands precise precision, certainty, precise knowledge, awareness. I don't think we should trust. I am mostly sure that he died. I think we need to be certain that Jesus died. Amen? Amen? So one fellow said it like this. If Jesus died, it's irrefutable proof that he died. Amen? Despite the fact that Jesus did die, and we have irrefutable proof that he did die, there are those that say, no, he didn't die. I'm serious, that's heart attack. I'm saying that there are theologians, people that are supposed to be Bible students, and they're, uh, they're teachers and preachers to try to help people with eternity. There are some of them, they're not the only ones, but there are some of them, they promoted this. They said, Jesus did die on the cross that day. No, no, he passed out. He kind of went into a coma. And then when they took him down off the cross, he's in a coma, he really wasn't dead. And they put him in that tomb there and it was kind of cool and crisp air in there and it revived him. Do you know why they want to say that he didn't die? Because they want to say he didn't rise from the dead. Are you getting it? Now when the Phoenicians invented the cross, they invented it for certainty to be a horrific death. The finality of the cross is death. The Romans took it over from the Phoenicians and the Romans even uh, made it even... Oh, if you can make it more atrocious, they made it more atrocious. The Romans would take people that they hung on the cross, sometimes they left them on the cross until they rotted. The animals came and tore at them. The birds came and picked at them. And all they have is left is a skeleton and it falls to the foot of the cross. They would leave them just hanging there. There were other times that the soldiers took these crucified people on their crosses and took them to the Colosseum and torched them. They bathed them in some kind of oil and made lamps out of them so they could have night games. It's horrific what some of the Romans did to these crucified people. But the certainty of it is that it's death. So with our Savior, Jesus Christ, they didn't leave Him on the cross. They didn't take Him to a night game. In fact, they wanted to get Him down off the cross. If you'll turn to John 19, I'll show you what I'm talking about. John chapter 19. This is concerning the crucifixion of Jesus and we could jump in lots and lots of different places but I want to try to get across a couple of, in my opinion, serious points and so let's see if we could, or several of them. We're going to jump in at verse 30. Here it is. John 19, 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain uh, upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, they besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Now let's stop just a minute. We've got several things going on here. Jesus is dead. The Jewish people said, he can't be on the cross on the Sabbath day because uh, that would be a violation of our laws. In fact, they, they, they've got an obscure verse out of Deuteronomy that says you can, no man can be left hanging on a tree or in a tree cannot be or it would defile the land. 
So these Jewish leaders were so worried about defiling the land. No, they didn't care about their lives. They didn't care about the kangaroo court. They didn't care about all the false witnesses they brought in. They just cared about, we don't want to defile the land. Incredible. It says this. It says, since they, they didn't want to leave him up on the cross because they didn't want him there on the Sabbath day. Now there's a complication right in there, just a tiny bit of complication. Many people, they uh, have the opinion Jesus died on Friday and then he, the Sabbath is on Saturday and he rose on Sunday. They call it Good Friday, in fact, it's on our calendar. Well, see, we would say it's impossible for him to die on Friday because he had to be in the grave three days and three nights. You can't get three days and three nights out of Friday. No matter if you take common core math or not, you can't do it. <laughs> Amen. So anyway, so wait a minute. Isn't Saturday the Sabbath? Uh, yes. Well, they said we can't leave him on the cross for it's the Sabbath. Can't leave him up there. Well, why do they call it the Sabbath if it's not on Friday? Well, here's something that we need to be aware of. Because it says, for that Sabbath was a high day. Every Saturday is a Sabbath. It doesn't matter what, what part of the calendar it's on. If it's Saturday, it's the Sabbath. That's how it is. It's on the Jewish calendar. It's on our calendar. It's the Sabbath. But a high day might not be on Saturday. The high day was, was uh, they have different high days, and I'll just give you a couple of them, like uh, the Feast of Passover, that's a high day. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's a high day. The Feast of First Fruits, that's a high day. Uh, let me just give you this, for instance, it's like on the Passover, we know that the Passover is always the 14th of Nisan. That's the Hebrew word Nisan. It would be the 14th of April. That's the Passover for the Jewish people. It's when they celebrate it. Do you know the 14th of April is not always on Saturday? Sometimes it's on Monday. Sometimes it's on Tuesday. But whatever the 14th day is, it would be a high day. Our Savior Jesus was crucified on Passover day. We believe it to be Wednesday. But there's something else about the calendar you need to be aware of. Jesus, they, they started, he, he hung on the cross from 9 a.m. He's dead at 3 p.m. Six hours, he's, he's dead. Uh, the Jewish clock, it's 24 hours just like ours, but theirs is different than ours. It will be tomorrow. At what time on our clock will it be tomorrow? 12 midnight. Right? It'll be today's Monday. It'll be Tuesday. At midnight. Not on their clock. At 6 p.m. at night, it'll be Tuesday. The next day starts at 6 p.m. Here's something that you, on a high day or a Passover day, you can do no servile work. You, you can only walk so many steps to keep the law. You couldn't work a physical job. If it was on Saturday, they couldn't work. There was no work done on Saturday. There was no work done on the high day, on the Sabbath day, they called it. So at 6 p.m., they've got to get Jesus off that cross in the tomb before 6 p.m. because they're not allowed to do that kind of labor after 6 p.m. because it's the high day kind of wild isn't it? so he's dead at three they have three hours and these Jewish people are going we got to get him off the cross we got to get him buried we got to do it now because we, we it's going to be a Passover it's a high day we got to do this is everybody with me so they went to Pilate and said hey we got this we got this law that we got to get him off the cross we can't leave him up there because we don't know what to file the land we got to get him down so here's what Pilate did Verse 31, the Jews therefore, because it was a preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Why do they want to break their legs? Why do they want to break their legs? They're already hanging on a cross. 
because they're not dead. Their legs are propping them up. Their gravity's pulling on them. You know that when on the cross they didn't die from the nails in the hand. They die from suffocation, asphyxiation. The rib cage is pushing on the lungs, pushing on the lungs, and they <gasps> they're gasping for air, and then finally they got so worn out and tired, and the gravity's pulling on them, they die. You know it's what's recorded. It was recorded that one man. He was alive on the cross for over a week before he died. Mercy. If they break their legs, there's nothing to prop them up and hold them. And they'll just go ahead and suffocate right away. That's why they want to break their legs. Here we go. What to heaven? Verse 32. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he uh, that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. Look at verse 36. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And look at verse 37. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Now watch, watch. This Roman soldier didn't walk up to Jesus and say, I can't break any bones because that scripture. They didn't care anything about the scripture. Yeah. They didn't say, hey, that scripture says something about piercing. You know, something about jam this spear in me. When he put the spear in Jesus' side, it says blood and water came out. I know you already heard this, but around the heart, there's a, a bag that goes around the heart. And inside the sack or the bag is water. It's between our pleurisy. And so in between the heart and the bag, there's this fluid, this water that helps the heart function and stay lubricated, blah, blah, and so on. When he put that spear in there, pull it out, water and blood both came out. So at least he pierced that sack where the water came out. Amen? That's why we know Jesus is dead. Now watch this. We'll just go ahead and finish this. Verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly... Why was he a secret disciple? It says it right here. For fear of the Jews. He besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. Stop right there, please, please. Nicodemus, uh, Joseph of Arimathea is not the last secret agent for Jesus. We've still got secret agents around today. They don't want anybody to know that they're a follower of Jesus. But they, they do. They just don't want to tell anybody to know. Everybody with me? Yeah. Just saying, it's still going on today. Joseph is a wealthy man. In fact, we know that he has a tomb that is close to where Jesus got crucified. And so, if um, I've had privilege to be in Israel, if you're standing where Jesus got crucified, and then you go this way to the my right, go this way, the wall is here, this way, down just a couple hundred yards is a, a garden tomb area, sepulcher area. And uh, that's where Jesus would have been buried. Joseph of Arimathea owned that. He paid someone to chisel out of rock, dig it out, chisel it out, so you could bury your family in there. There's more than one burial spot in there. There's a slab here and a slab here. And then there's a floor that, it, it, that is this big that's open. And when they buried someone in there, they didn't bury one person. And it cost too much money. And after a while, they would put another person in there, and they'd put another person in there. And then as those bodies deteriorated and so on, they could move those bodies, and they would put another body, or they would put them on top of each other. They'd put whole families in there. And Jesus was buried at Joseph's tomb. He's a wealthy man. He came and he said, I wanted the body, and Pilate gave him leave. And watch verse 39. There came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus 
and Wildman and Lennon Claus. Let's just stop, please. Stop a second. Nicodemus? Who's he? He's the John 3.16 guy. In John 3.1 it says and, uh, Nicodemus, he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Master, we know that thou art come from God. No man can do the miracles thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus said, you must be born again. And he said, how can a man be born when he do? Can he enter the second time to his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, no, that was just born of flesh is flesh. That was born of spirit is spirit. And Jesus said, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. And then the famous verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you know when you and I get finished reading the book of John, chapter 3, when we get done, we don't know if Nicodemus is a believer or not. In fact, if we did not have this passage in John 19, we would not know today. Nicodemus, nowhere is it recorded that he became a believer, except right here. He also didn't speak up for Christ. I thought this was fascinating. It says that Nicodemus, that Joseph has got permission, but Nicodemus came also, and it said he brought a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes. Now that would be to prepare a body for burial. So to prepare a body for burial, a hundred pounds, you know what the historians say? They say a hundred pounds is the same amount of myrrh and aloes they would use to bury a king. And that's not a surprise, is it? He is king of kings. I thought that's fascinating. Now, I, don't, I think it's verse 40. Look at that. I want to show you something. Yeah, it is verse 40. Then took they the body. Who took the body? It says they did. To me, it sounds like Joseph and Nicodemus. Amen? I cannot prove it was just them two. I can. Because wealth, wealth has privileges. Joseph has wealth and he has servants. He has helpers. He has people work for him. He could have had them do it. Nicodemus, he's a wealthy fellow too. He's high up. He's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's a chief. And he, he had means. And he could have had people help him. That's not what the Bible says. It says, then took they the Bible. So here's what I'm considering. When Joseph and Nicodemus got to that cross and there's this Jesus hanging there, how'd they get him down? Let's just say Jesus is a grown man. He's 37 years old. He's a grown man. Well, let's say he doesn't weigh a whole lot. He just weighs 140 pounds, 150 Jesus is not going to help them. And then they got to lift the cross out of the hole with this weight on it. I don't think they just dumped it on the ground. I, I don't know. I've had people come to Brother Day and they didn't do that because, you know, they had this lift thing, these pulleys, and they, Jesus was nailed to this cross timber first and then he was raised up on it. And I go, well, how did all the joints get out a loose? The Bible says all of his joints came loose while he's on the cross. So I'm thinking it's when it thudded down in the hole. Regardless, how did they get him? No, no, no. Okay, now he's laying down. The cross is laying down. How did they get him off the cross? He's got these spikes in his hands and feet. If you and I go down to Home Depot or Lowe's today or Ace Hardware and we're looking, I need something to pull spikes out of a timber. Today's technology and tools we have today, what would you get? They had to get those spikes. I don't think they went like this. Well, they may have. I don't know. I just know they got to get him off the cross. Then they got to get him from here, somewhere close to a little over 100 yards down there to the garden tomb. There was a well down there because it's a garden tomb. And I believe that's where they cleaned the body of Jesus. Wow. Can you 
picture Joseph at the head of Jesus? Bent over the head of Jesus and he's got this pail of water and these claws and he's trying to get all the blood out of Jesus' hair. Jesus is a bloody pulp. He's trying to get the blood out of his ears, out of his neck. I could just picture Joseph tenderly, but yet trying to get the blood out, that he finally he bends over and he kisses Jesus somewhere on the head and says, I'm sorry. But I was ashamed. I'm sorry I didn't stand up for you. I'm sorry, Jesus. Perhaps Nicodemus trying to clean the hand of Jesus. We have these wrinkles all in our knuckles and around our fingernails. He's trying to get the blood out. He's trying to get the blood off. I can picture Nicodemus sometime picking up the hand of the Savior and kissing him and saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I didn't make an issue and stand up for you, Christ. They cleaned the entire body of Jesus. I didn't tell you this a while ago, but he's got a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloe. Do you know how much like a gallon of water, a gallon of milk, a gallon of oil weighs? Eight it weighs just a little, real close to eight pounds. So if you divide a hundred by eight, you're going to be in the neighborhood of, you got somewhere close to 13 gallons of Crisco. I don't know if they use that to help clean the body. They may have. That's a lot of oil to put on one person. I don't know if they soak the linen cloths in that, but I'm telling you, they wrapped him just exactly like you think, like a mummy. They wrapped him. They wrapped his whole body, except they didn't wrap his head. The Bible says they put a napkin on his face. Look at the Bible. Watch what it says. Verse 40, Then took they the body and wound it in linen cloths with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher where was never man yet laid. There laid they, Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Wow. Jesus is buried. It's before 6 p.m. It's done. They've got a stone that rolls in front of the hole of the sepulcher. Why would they put a stone up there? Well, a couple reasons. One is they want to keep the animals out. Two is that they want to be able to get back in there to put other members of the family. That's what's common. Wow. These God-haters and God-deniers, they want to say, well, well, wait a minute, he really didn't die. He just kind of passed out. Mercy, folks. Yeah. If he did not die, you've almost got a bigger miracle than a resurrection. Here's what happened. If he just passed out and went into a little coma, that means he shook off the effects of everything that happened to him before the cross. He hasn't slept in over 24 hours. He shook off the effects of of the cat of nine tails and then beaten around the head and shoulders with a rod. He shook off the effects of being nailed uh, to a cross. He shook off the effects of a spear deep in his side that wounds near his heart. He shook off the effects of being wrapped in over a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloe and cloth. And he unwrapped himself somehow and he moved a 4,000 pound rock and snuck out and nobody saw him. That is a bigger miracle than rising from the dead, folks. But that's what they want us to believe that, well, he really didn't die. He just kind of, you know, he passed out there. No, Jesus was buried because he was dead. That's irrefutable proof that he is dead. Now when Jesus was buried, watch what the Bible says, our sins were buried with Him. 
And since they were buried with him, he put away our sins. That's how the Bible says it. So you know that when Jesus was buried, he wasn't the only one buried in there. No, Brother David just said no man had ever yet laid. They buried him in there. But he wasn't the only one. I was buried with him too. Every person that receives him as Savior was buried with him. And the placement of our sin was upon him. And our sin was buried with him also. And so Jeremiah 31 says uh, that I will forgive their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. In Micah, it says uh, that will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. In Psalm, it says, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. In Isaiah, it says, thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. And, verse, and Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, their iniquities will I remember no more. God put our sins on Jesus, in Jesus, and Jesus buried our sins, and they are now in the depths of the sea, and nobody can find them. Amen. How far are they away? They're as far as the east is from the west. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can start walking north, you can start walking north, you can keep walking north, you can keep walking north, but one day you'll start walking south. Right. But once you start walking east, you keep walking east, you ain't never going to walk west. As far as the east is from the west. Another fellow pointed out to me, he said, Brother David says it's behind his back. Our sins are behind his back. Now, have you ever thought about God is omnipresent? And I said, well, yeah, he's omnipresent. He said, well, do you know what that means? Don't you? And I go, well, he's everywhere at the same time. Said, yeah, that's what it means. Well, that means he's right here. He's right here. He's right here. He's right here. There's nowhere that he's not. So we actually put our sins in a place that doesn't even exist. They're gone. Damn. Ladies and gentlemen, they're gone. Damn. Our sins are gone. Just like the song says, G-O-N-E, gone. Amen. See, here's the deal. Our enemy does not leave us alone and stop bothering us after we become believers, after we're Christians. And so when we do foul up and we do mess up, our enemy comes and puts his foot on our neck and he says, See there, my friend? You're a waste of God's air. You're a waste of God's time. You tell people you're a preacher. You tell people you're a Christian. Look how you behave. And the, the, the liar, the manipulator, he will try, the deceiver will try to get us to say, You're right. I quit. I give up. I declare to you tonight what you and I need to do is throw his foot off of our neck point our finger back to an empty tomb and say, hey, Bubba, my sins are gone. Amen. Amen. God's forgiven us. That's right. They're buried. I am no longer, I am no longer a slave to sin. I don't have to sin. Do I sin? Yes, but I don't have to because I am dead to sin. If I will reckon it to be so. Can somebody say amen? amen? Our sins are gone. They are buried with Him. I thought it was fascinating. i got lots more to do, but I'll do one more thing. I thought it was fascinating that uh, <clears throat> He says, I will remember their iniquities no more. He says, I will remember your iniquities no more. See, he doesn't say, I will forget your iniquities. If God forgets and he says he forgets, I think he could forget. But in our head, when we forget something, there might be something come along that would jar our memory. And we would, oh, 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 yeah, now I remember. But God doesn't say, I forget them. He says, I will remember them no more. Amen. I'm not going to bring them up against you. They're gone. They're paid for. I'm not going to hold you responsible. They are paid for in Jesus Christ. Amen. That is a hallelujah. If you're not a believer, if you're not saved, I'm telling you Christ died for our sins. For your sins too. Praise His name. If you'll receive Him and His forgiveness, you can be forgiven and your sins be gone. When you stand before Him, you stand before Him righteous.
just like you never sinned. No, no, not with your righteousness, with his righteousness. Hallelujah. If you are saved, and I just think it's almost like a revival to say, I'm not going to let sin control me anymore. Amen. I'm dead to sin. My sins are gone. I'm not going to let Satan have that kind of power and authority over me. I am one of God's kids. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's stand together. I'd like to pray with you, please. Let's pray. Our great God, I do come to you again. I want to say thank you. Oh, hallelujah for the Holy Bible, for your word. Thank you, Jesus, that you not only died for my sin, you buried them in the depths of the sea. They are gone. Praise your name, Jesus. I pray that me, myself, that I would reckon myself indeed dead to sin. In Christ, that this congregation that us, that we would make the commitment, the decision, we're not going to let sin reign in our mortal bodies. We're going to reckon ourselves dead. Thank you, Christ. Thank you that we don't have to have the fear of our sin hanging over our head. Our sin is gone. Praise your name. We love you tonight. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for proving that you love us. I pray we love you like you want us to. If we need to rededicate, recommit, I pray we would tonight. If there are those not saved, I pray they'd want to get saved tonight. It's in your holy name I pray, Christ. Miss Phyllis is going to play the organ as she plays. If you want to spend some time in prayer, you're welcome to come right now. We use the front of the building as an altar. You can use your seat as an altar.